So this project is going to be made in uh, Unity version uh, 2022.3.45 F1. So if you do not have that version, what you're going to do is you're going to go to installs and then you're going to say install editor and there'll be um, you're just right here. Um, I already installed it, but uh, you will need this version of Unity um, to work on this project. I just want to make sure that it actually uh, works for everyone. Uh, so ideally, we're all using the same version of Unity. Anyway, I'm going to open up the proper version of this project, which is this one. OK. So I'm just going to start by talking um, about how Unity works. Um, if you guys are not already familiar with Unity, it is probably one of the most popular game engines uh, currently uh, commercially available. I am personally uh, not a person who uses it. I use uh, Unreal Engine instead. And we have, a, I know there's also some people who use Godot, but um, this first workshop is going to focus on Unity. So the organization of Unity, uh, if you open up any editor, um, I'm just in this project, but you can open up any fresh project because I think we'll have to make it from scratch and I'll figure out a way to get this to you guys after the fact if you guys wanted to see what essentially I was working up to. Uh, here in the editor, uh, this right here, it might be in a different place uh, depending on how you have your Unity set up. The layout might be different, but instead, essentially there are a few critical panes. Um, you'll have a project pane which looks like this. It might be, it could be anywhere. Uh, mine just happens to be down here. Um, a console pane, which is where you'll see any debug statements or error messages if you have some kind of logical or other error in your code, or if there was an issue like loading something or whatnot. Uh, the project folder just has all of your assets. So it will have um, packages that you've downloaded, any assets such as a uh, materials, meshes, uh, images, and then all your C-sharp scripts. Uh, the hierarchy pane will actually contain all of the ob game objects in a scene. And a game object is essentially uh, a Unity object uh, that can access all of the features they built up into it. So it'll support like all their transform uh, information, whether that's uh, rotation, location, scale, quaternions. It will support the, uh, it will support them um, I enumerators for making coroutine timers, as well as uh, the start, awake, and um, what's the last one called? Update method. To to start off with, I think I'm, I'm going to have, oh yeah, by the way, if you guys have any questions, like if I'm going too fast or if it's otherwise hard to follow along, um, please feel free to unmute and interrupt me. I'll try to look at the chat every once in a while in case someone says something. But uh, like I said, I was trying to have you guys actually download this whole project. But for some reason, it complains about the file path being too long uh, when you unzip it. So I don't know how exactly to um, go around that, because like I said, I don't usually um, distribute um, editor versions of Unity. So anyway, to start, I'm going to ask that you guys create a folder for uh, your, a, a game object, uh, any game object. So I called mine game object folder, but all I need you guys to do is right click hit create and make a folder. Um, once you do that, um, what I'm going to have you guys do is right click into your hierarchy pane, uh, go to 3D object, and you can just choose a capsule component. Uh, the name is important. Just hit enter, uh, which will uh, create it in the scene. The location seems kind of somewhat random to me. But um, once you've done that, you want to click on it and drag it into your project pane uh, folder, which will create uh, turn it into a prefab. So what a prefab is, is essentially, um, let's say you've made some kind of um, object in a scene. It could be a collection of objects or uh, with all these components and whatnot, and you wanted to save it. Essentially, the way you go about that is by making a prefab. So a prefab will uh, also save any changes you've made to it out in the, uh, even if they're already placed in the world. So now that I've made this like capsule prefab, for example, I'm actually going to kind of center it over here so we can actually see it. Uh, 
Here it is. So um, if I theoretically wanted to ch make a change to this, this is not a prefab, this is the actual object. If I want to make a change to this, let's say I wanted to add some uh, script to it. I'm just going to use one of my already made scripts. I like this. You'll see that um, if I actually open up the prefab editor by double clicking it, that's not saved. That's because once you drag a prefab out into the world, it's an instance of the prefab and changes are one direction. So if I make a change here in the prefab editor, it will be reflected on all the existing prefabs uh, out in the scenes. Uh, however, if I make any changes to the prefab I place in the scene that is not reflected in the editor, that's just an individual change to this one prefab. Okay, so um, what I'm going to have you guys do now is actually make a separate folder uh, just called scripts. Same way, just right click, create a C sharp script. Um, and you don't have to organize these uh, a lot, but I like to encourage uh, you keep all your stuff organized. So what I additionally did in, uh, with that was I created a player script uh, folder here, and then I actually filled it with all the scripts I made for this tutorial. So to make a C sharp script is um, you're going to right click in your player scripts folder if you made one, go to create and go to C sharp script. It's going to ask you to give it a name. I'm just going, I would call this one just a uh, player or whatever you want. Uh, I, uh, in this instance, I actually called it uh, entity player because it was, it was actually the basis for like a whole entity system. Either way, um, if you open it up with Visual Studio or uh, your preferred IDE, you'll end up with something like this. Okay, I'm actually going to pause here and make sure that people have been able to follow along with that so far. Um, so has anyone had any problems getting to this point? I'm going, I kind of want to take that as a yes, but can like you guys like say in chat, like things have been working for you guys so far. You guys have managed to create a prefab. Uh, that's just a capsule. You've created um, the scripts folder, and you also like um, uh, what was the other thing? Sorry, uh, you also created the player script. Uh, still downloading the older. I'll uh, I can go over it again for uh, with you after. I just kind of want to get things started so people aren't sitting here too long. Uh, how about the rest of you guys? You guys have been able to get this far. Vision. Okay, so I have a feeling that there's a decent chunk of people here who are still downloading this version of Unity. So I actually might pause here and then make another attempt to get this project uploaded so that there's like that groundwork here for you. So, so we're not building it from scratch because it seems like a lot of people still actually need the editor downloaded, refuses to download. Okay, all right, nice, okay. Well, not nice, but I'm assuming you guys at least have the Unity Hub, right? Like, you guys have uh, this. You guys have the Unity Hub. If you don't, that's perfectly OK. Um, I can just show you. OK. Yeah, and just in case anyone doesn't know, literally, if you just look up like Unity, I'm pretty sure the first thing that shows up is just the download link for the Unity Hub, which is this one right here. When you click it, they're going to ask you to make uh, an account. I'm not going to download this because I already have it. But when you do that, they're going to ask you to make an account. Um, it's just email password. Then they'll ask you to verify. You'll say yes, and you'll have that. So um, essentially, then you'll end up with this. And you'll have, when you download Unity, actually, for the first time, if you are one of those people, it should actually, I believe it should already just have 2022.3.45F1 uh, already installed. Uh, if not, like I said, uh, you'll start off in the project pane, go to installs, install editor 2022.3.45F1, and just hit install here. All right. So while you guys are doing that, I'm going to try to figure out if there's an easy way to move uh, the packages I want over for you guys, because I, I think it would be really helpful if this actually worked. So 
So while this is opening and the other stuff's going on, I am going to talk a bit about how Unity um, deals with uh, objects in the world <laughs> online learning continuously. I, uh, this part was honestly a little difficult for me to fully grasp when I started using Unity because I came from Unreal Engine, which does things very differently. But essentially, in Unity, secretly, everything is just an empty. And all an empty is, is tr a transform. So a location, rotation, and scale data in 3D space, or 2D if you're using Unity 2D. So everything is actually just an empty with components added onto it. So like, um, I don't know what I grabbed there. But uh, so if you look at, like for example, this um, Among Us player character I made, uh, it's actually just a transform, and then they just attach to it a capsule, a mesh filter component, a mesh renderer component, um, and a capsule collider. And then I added a rigid body and the scripts I needed to make the character work, as That's well as so goaded. I love it. <laughs> as well as a material. So um, I, I just want to make sure that everyone kind of recognize that because it's actually a very uh, interesting. Uh, implementation of like objects is usually because you're used to like it being like one centralized class and then um like sub components being added onto it but essentially it's just like every component will have its own stuff going on all right i think my other product opened yeah it did okay so i'm gonna close it yeah okay i'm gonna see if i can actually go into this uh Okay, I'm in the assets folder. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulty here. I did not expect it to fail to download. Uh, if you just download it off the link I sent you. So I'm going to actually, if this works, I'm going to upload the, the new link. Uh, and that should give you the assets uh, folder. Oh, it looks like this. Yeah, okay, it looks like this actually worked. All right, that's great. Okay, so uh, I'm really quickly going to pivot to giving you guys this link right here. Um, I'm gonna copy this into general chat, and you're going to. I'm gonna need you guys to uh, basically uh, reproduce the steps I did here. Um, essentially, what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a new project uh, in Unity, or I get uh, like a, a new project. Uh, you can right click on these three dots, go to Show and Explorer. Um, if you're using Windows 11 or something else that adds multiple times, I would actually open this up and then. Open up a new tab, go to downloads, download that workshop um, zipped folder I gave you. Oh, when you open it up, uh, there'll be inside an assets, uh, project settings, and a um, packages folder. Um, you're going to delete the corresponding packages, project settings, and assets folder in your um, inside of your project, and you're just going to drag the workshop ones in, and that essentially gives you uh, the project. So uh, once you guys do that, what you're going to end up with is a, I'm going to save this real quick and close. Once you do that, you'll basically end up with the copy uh, project that I was trying to give you guys earlier. And once you load it up and hit play, you should be able to just move around. Uh, you have to click into the window because the mouse appears. And you should be able to at least move around and like look around at the camera. So um, this is the point I was hoping that uh, you guys would be at once you download that zip. You guys are able to access it, right? Um, when you click the link, it just let you download it? Yeah. All right, that's good. Um, if anyone uh, is confused about the steps here, please uh, feel free to unmute and let me know. Again, you're just going to the project. You're creating a blank project. Um, OK. So when you. So create a blank Unity project and then download the zip at the link I sent you. That blank project, you're going to right, uh, left click here, show in Explorer, uh, open it. This is your actual Unity project. Um, what you're going to need to do is delete project settings, packages, and assets. And then that zip I gave you, um, you're going to right click it, extract all, and it's going to open up a, it's going to open up a, fi a, fo a folder. Uh, once you go in, inside of here will be a um, that a corresponding assets, packages, and project settings folder. Uh, just drag it into the project. So you're basically you're replacing the default project assets 
project settings and packages with the ones I made for this workshop. Um, it's the alternative. It's the kind of roundabout way of getting you guys to install the project because the actual straight up project um, download I provided for you guys does not seem to be working at the moment because of like a file path issue. Um, and once you do that and you open the project, you should actually load up right into this scene, uh, like so. And I was saying, if you hit play here, um, you'll be in the version of the project that is missing a, a number of scripts that we're going to uh, really quickly recreate uh, so that your character can uh, jump and shoot and do the other things that I had uh, set up. You should end up right here uh, in this little world. Uh, like I said, with the um, uh, with some uh, warnings because some code is missing uh, on purpose. If you go, uh, yeah, mine's yeah, mine's working fine now. I all right, that's great. I'm in. All right, perfect. So if you actually look in here, you'll notice that there is some stuff missing. First of all, our shooting function is completely blank, except for our game object reference. And you'll also notice that our jumping doesn't actually do anything just yet. Um, these are the first two things I'm going to have you guys make uh, really quickly before I go on. I'm going to make sure everyone else is here, right? For those who are ready, I'm going to go forward, but I'll loop back around and help you guys who are still um, downloading and having trouble. I just don't want to wait too long to get everything started just so that uh, we're able to at least get a little bit done beyond uh, opening Unity. All right. So for those who have been able to download it, you should be in your player controller.cs file. Um, just so you guys know, uh, or when it's the structure, you're gonna from the main assets directory, you're gonna open up in your project pane scripts by double clicking on it, then player scripts, and then it's right here, player controller.cs. Uh, you're just gonna double click on it to open it, and then once you do that, you'll see there's a bunch of code I already wrote um, to get this guy working. Uh, this is movement and looking around. Um, I will go over all of it later. Um, but for now, I'm going to talk about uh, the actual um, movement, or the two functions that are missing, which are jump here and shoot. I think I'm going to start with jump, because it's the simpler one. Essentially, this is a function uh, in a form you guys should be uh, familiar with. Uh, you have your access specifier, uh, public, protected, or private. Um, your, retur your return type, which in this case is void, but it could be anything. It could be a float, it could be a game object, a boolean, doesn't matter. The name of your function, and this is something that is unique to the enhanced input system that Unity has. Um, essentially, it's asking for a specific instance of a action being performed. And that is what this input action callback context is, is that so you know what, um, what this, uh, the status of this input is and then it's just a variable named context. So this context has a couple different forms. It has performed, canceled, uh, started, and ongoing. They trigger uh, at different times, and they're actually what's being bound up here. Is that you see? I, I make a player input component that's supposed to handle the enhanced input system. I enable it. Um, I enable it here, and then uh, I bind each of these input actions I made to certain statuses, um, so performed, canceled, or uh, you could do start as well. Start is only called once the input action starts. Performed is called uh, whenever it's going on, uh, whenever it's like uh, receives the input, and canceled is when it stops. So the only instance where I actually use canceled is to stop moving because of how the movement works so far. But um, going back to the jump function, uh, I have an if statement here. In this instance, because I actually bound it to performed already, it's actually kind of redundant because the context you already know is performed because that's when the function is called. Uh, the, I forgot to mention the plus equals is just telling it to bind it to the function, uh, telling that uh, certain input action to bind to a function. Um, anyway, so this is kind of redundant, but this is actually important. So what it does is it gets a reference to the actual player um, script that I wrote earlier called uh, entity player. It goes to this entity statistics struct that I made in that class. I'm actually just going to shut off to you guys real quick. It's actually right here. So in that player scripts directory, if I open it up, um, it is just um, this is like the, supposed to be the central hub for anything regarding to the player, where the controller specifically for input is how I broke it up. So it has like a reference to the health bar and the entity statistics uh, and all that and stuff. Uh, 
really quickly, I'm also going to open up entity statistics, which is right here. This is just a serialized struct um, that's holding like all the player stats, like how many times can they jump, what's their movement speed, how much health do they have, etc. Essentially, um, it's just this is just a straight up C sharp uh, enum enumerator. Uh, sorry, uh, C sharp uh, class. What I'm doing by serializing it is allowing the default values to be changed in the editor. So a system that's serializable is something that you can put on certain uh, classes if you want to be able to actually go into the panes uh, and enter and uh, edit the values. So if you notice here, if I go down here to the entity statistics, you'll see um, I can actually change the values. But I don't do it that way. I actually just did it directly um, into in the code. So if you go back to the entity player.cs, you'll see that I directly set them uh, here. So you have 100 health. Um, you can jump twice. And this is just the movement speed uh, coefficient for the character, which can be edited to fit your needs. And then going back to the jump function, uh, I actually did take that jump value and I check if it's less than the maximum number of jumps that the character can do. Um, and here's where the implementation comes in. So in the actual cop in the complete version, you can see that um, when I do that, I actually take a reference to the rigid body that I um, specified uh, up here. I just made a public variable and I uh, got the component that has the rigid body um, on this game object that is the player, and I'm accessing that here, and I'm calling the add force function for the rigid body. So in Unity, rigid bodies are essentially uh, physics objects that will interact with colliders and collision. Uh, the way this happens primarily is uh, kind of, it's kind of up to you how much you want to interact with it. But essentially, all you need to know is that this is what allows our character to collide with the ground. If I did not have a rigid body, um, I wouldn't really have any physics applied to me, and I would clip through just about anything. Um, essentially, uh, I'm going to go back to the actual rigid body reference that you guys need to copy into the jump function. Uh, this rigid body reference, we're just adding a force to it. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to expect a vector, as you can see here, and a force mode. So uh, this is a three dimensional vector, hence vector three. It's going to have the three components x, y, and z. Um, for those not familiar with C sharp, um, the sense this is like a an object, you need to instantiate it with a new keyword. You can also pass in a vector directly, but I'm not trying to reference any existing vector. I want to create a new one because this is uh, for how how we jump. So I create a new vector three. I don't want to move. I don't want to move to the left, to the right, up or down, or sorry. I don't want to move like side to side in any um, orthogonal way. I just want to move straight up. So in Unity. Uh, the y-axis is actually the up-axis. So x is uh, up and down. Uh, is, uh, if you take an object here, you can see x is like left and right, and z is back and forward, and then y is up, the green one. So we're trying to move up on that y-axis. And um, that is uh, what this vector is telling us. And the force mode is just how is, how is this force being applied um, Applied. You can say used impulse, but there's other options. Um, there's like acceleration, uh, velocity change, and whatnot. I'm gonna make this uh, and return this that. And then um, in addition to uh, so this is the actual thing that makes us jump. And this right here is just um, incrementing our jump counter so that um, we can't jump more times than is allowed by whatever our max jump variable is. So I'm gonna really quickly copy this into the uh, demo project I made earlier, right here. Uh, I want to hit File and Save. And then I want to go back to Unity. Uh, so now, uh, once I do that, the character should be able to jump. Yep. So when I hit the, when you hit the space bar, which is what I bound the action to, uh, your character will jump. You can see I can jump twice. And after I do the second jump, pressing the space bar doesn't do anything until I land on the ground again. Um, so if you just uh, copied these two lines of code, uh, your character should now be able to jump. Does everyone kind of under has everyone kind of gotten to that point? Sorry if I'm also over explaining things. I just try to make sure that you guys get like a good 
understanding of like exactly everything that's going on, and I'll elaborate on some of the things I skipped over as well. Wait, did you send the code anywhere, or is it, or am I, am I supposed to? Sorry, oh. I, was, I was like in the rest. Oh of yeah, sorry. You're gonna sorry. So you guys, for you guys, this is right here is going to be blank, uh, like this. So yeah. if you go to your entity or your player controller.cs, go to line ninety five, hit enter at the end, and then you're gonna need to write these two lines. So these are the only two lines that will be missing for you guys. So you're gonna type in rigid body reference um, dot add force, um, and then the two parameters you're passing in is a new vector um, that has a force that's just like a up vector uh, that has a, a magnitude of sixty, and then a impulse force mode and then you're going to increment the jump counter because if you did not increment the jump counter if for, if you for example didn't do anything or you decremented it it would never hit like the it would never uh, reach the jump count max and so you'd be able to jump infinitely i could actually show that to you guys in a moment once i think people have had a sufficient time to copy this code i have a question what binded the jump to space was that Automatic or? Oh, I'll, I'll show you. I'm actually going to show you guys that next. I just want to do the code first because the code is like the actual make it running part. And I'm going to explain uh, how this part of the enhanced input system works uh, next. All so, right, awesome. yeah, I'll show you guys that next. I'm, we're actually going to add a new key to jump in addition to space. I'm going to, I'm going to walk you guys through that. Uh, just let me know when you're done and then I'll move on. And if anyone missed them, I'll, like I said, I'll be pasting the completed project. Um, well, actually, you guys already have it. Or no, you don't. You have the demo one. I'll be posting the completed project shortly after the workshop, and I'll also go back and help people individually um, after I've kind of gone through a bit more information. Uh, make sure you got it. You guys also want to make sure you save this because if you don't actually save it, it's not going to recompile, and then it's not going to apply the changes. So once you save it, you should be good. All right. So going back to Unity, I actually should close the game. I'm actually surprised that let me do that. All right. Um, so we got a question about how the input works. So uh, this is, Unity has essentially two input systems. The first one I'll really quickly show off in actually that same script that we were just in. Um, it is the old system, which was a direct binding to um, certain uh, inputs that were hard, like, hard coded in. So it's actually what I use to control the camera at the moment because um, I wanted to show up both systems. So I made a variable called control rotation appear in the global scope. So uh, I guess before I clarify that as well, if you declare a variable in a function here, like this movement uh, vector, for example, this is a local variable that will actually stop existing uh, once you leave the scope of these uh, brackets here. If you want um, your, your uh, variable to exist along, as long as the object exists and needs to go outside of those functions, but inside the class. I usually put them all at the top because if you just spread them out like in between functions, it'd look a little weird and you might miss them. So I just put them at the top. That's how I get a reference to the rigid body and stuff. Um, and if you want to be able to access it from the Unity Editor, usually it has to be public so you can actually modify it. Otherwise, it's not visible. So this is the input system and so on and so forth. Uh, the one I wanted to show you guys right here is this string. Uh, mouse X and mouse Y. So in the old system for Unity that Unity had for movement, or sorry, for input, um, essentially what you'd do is you'd call input.getAxis, and then you'd type in a hard-coded string, like jump or, or um, mouse X or mouse Y, whatever. And then that would be how it... Um, that would be how it... Uh, figured out like which key you pressed, and then you'd also, and then you'd do your calculations on top of that to do whatever you wanted the, that button press to do. Um, it was very basic, so it means that you had to do everything else. So um, to kind of explain how look works really quickly using the old system, I have this uh, control rotation two-dimensional vector. I basically have a player settings um, struct that can hold that holds your look speed x and uh, look speed Y so that you can customize them to fit however you want it. Um, so, and on the X side of the vector, I bind the mouse X on the Y side, I bind mouse Y. And then I just clamp the Y between 90 and negative 90 so that when you're looking up and down, um, it does not go further, it does not go further than uh, 90 degrees in either direction. 
uh, from the out from the forward because otherwise you'd be able to flip the camera over. I'll show that in a second um, after I go through kind of explaining the rest. And then here is just uh, two quaternions. You don't really have to worry about this part. Uh, quaternions are basically used for rotation, and this is how I rotate the camera. And then I actually set the camera's uh, local rotation. Uh, I calculate it by multiplying the two quaternions together. Um, again, it's not a really important detail, but that's kind of the, uh, an example of how the old way worked. You can actually see, um, you can actually, if you go into project settings, you can and you go to input manager, you can actually see the axes. These are the names that you call the, the um, to actually bind those inputs. So, for example, if you see in the uh, player controller.cs, this this hard coded string here, mouse x, needed to match up exactly with this string because this is actually what it's binding. This is the actual input that it's binding to. So, um, by these are the, the ones that are default uh, in Unity. So you get like fire one two three jump mouse x y so on and so forth, and I, you could add some as well, I believe. But um, that is the old way. The, what's more important to understand is, is the new way to um, use the system. Essentially, what you need to do that is you need to go into your package manager up here, and you would actually um, download. Uh, let's see if I can find it really quick. You go in here and you download input system. You would. Right here it says remove because it's already in the project. But we did, uh, if you had a blank project, um, you would need to click add. And it would add this to your project. Uh, what you'd then be able to do is use their new enhanced input system, uh, which I put here in the, as uh, in the input folder. So if, from the assets directory, if you go into input, you'll see that there's this player input action asset. You can create it by going to create um, somewhere in here. I can't quite find it. I don't know, I can't see it, but it's somewhere in here. Uh, basically, you create the asset and you end up with one of these. What you do is when you double click it, you'll actually have a action maps, which are essentially a collection of, ap of actions in a certain context and actual action items. So if you notice, um, when we were binding these to the function here, there's this dot player part. That matches up with this. So what an action map is, like I said, is a collection of inputs. So if I want to make a new action map, I can call it whatever, and I can assign a bunch of actions to it that do things. Um, if I want to access these, then I would type in, instead of player, I type in that random string I made right here, because um, we're trying to access certain action contexts, and then from there, access very specific input mappings, and then bind those to functions. That's essentially like the workflow um, for the new system. Uh, so this action, this player map is supposed to hold just the inputs that the player would uh, use in the like default state. So you want to be able to interact, jump, look, move around, and shoot bullets. Um, let's say I had a system where your character can enter a vehicle. Well, then I could make a new action mapping and call it like vehicle, and then um, I would I would then add all of those vehicle specific inputs and to that action list. And maybe my character can swim. So um, when they can swim, they shouldn't be able to shoot or interact with things or jump. They can only look and move and maybe do some other stuff. So then if I want to do that, I'd make a swim action mapping and then apply actions. So um, you asked specifically where the jump is. Essentially, I just created an action mapping um, called jump. And uh, the bindings, as you can see down here, is just the keys you want it bound to. So actually. Uh, if you go to path, I actually bound it to, you have all the button, you have all like the input keys you could ask for. Um, I bound it to keyboard spacebar, and that is actually how the input action is received. But let's say you wanted to also be able to jump with, um, I don't know, let's say X. Oh, that's probably a bad way to do it. You want to go to keyboard. Uh, Let's go X. So now, um, once you do that, and you need to click Save Asset to make sure it actually works. Um, and now, if I were to theoretically uh, push X, it should actually let me. Yeah. So now, now, now I can just jump with the X key. 
and that is kind of the point of the whole new system, is that instead of hard coding specific keys to call specific functions, you make bindings, uh, you configure them how you want, and then you save them so that you can assign a bunch of different buttons to uh, different actions and move them around. So it's not like, um, it's just much more flexible. So like, let's say I had like, need to support gamepad and VR and stuff. I could also mind, uh, bind gamepad keys, uh, as well as other things to these functions so that the system works um, with uh, all those new inputs and it's, it's much less of a hassle. It's like a bit to set up, but um, once it gets set up, it's much more powerful than the old system. So by doing that, um, like I said, you're able to just bind, uh, create bindings however you want to new keys. Um, on the, under the hood, what it's doing is it's adding those bindings to this really complicated file. I it, I would not recommend uh, modifying this directly. I would just let the input um, asset uh, do all the modifications for you because, uh, yeah, it's kind of technical. I don't understand it personally. But um, that is essentially how that part works. Uh, all right, so moving on, uh, if we go back into your uh, player controller script, we're also going to add the code for shooting a, a bullet. So if you go into your player controller and go down to shoot, you'll see that line 102, we have a game object reference that's a reference to the projectile, but that doesn't do anything just yet. So what, I'm, what you're going to need to do is add um, and a few lines of code to actually do something. So kind of to, to go over the workflow is I already have the shoot bound to left click uh, using that enhanced input system. So when the left clicked uh, input action is performed, this function that is bound to it up above uh, with the rest of the bindings gets called with the context. And it's going to create a reference to a game object that is currently not set. So what we're going to want to do is then set it to a reference to an actual um, instance of a game object. So here the here's the code for that. Essentially, what I'm doing here is when you want to inst when you have a prefab in Unity, another useful thing you can do with them is instantiate um, um, copies of that prefab that you made. So essentially, I made a prefab bullet, and I am uh, assigning using that reference to kind of copy instances of that prefab um, with a, a certain location and rotation data. And then I'm able to manipulate it and, uh, as a independent object. So um, essentially, I want to copy this over really quick so that I can quickly tab over. Oh, the quaternion is just identity, by the way. It's just the normal quaternion. I can. Um, I cannot quite fit it all into the same screen, but I'm going to put that um, into this uh, the demo version, uh, and I'll go over each of these, um, explaining how exactly it's working. But before I do that, I need to go more in depth on prefabs. So um, I actually will show if um, the actual bullet prefab. So you go back to your assets folder, go to game objects, and you double click on this projectile thing. This is the actual prefab I made for the bullet. It's a green sphere that just has a sphere collider and the item projectile script on it and a rigid body. So the rigid body, again, allows it to like have all these physics applied to it. It gives it a um, mass and drag and other things. The item projectile script is what kind of is running uh, my game specific code uh, that I wrote um, for this bullet. So essentially, once you make a prefab, um, I'm actually going, if you click this right here, or you can click it directly into the, in the uh, scene panel, um, and you go down to that um, player controller script, basically what I did is I dragged um, this prefab reference into um, this slot here so that I have a reference to the projectile that I am trying to instantiate. This is true of any game object. So if I actually go back into um, here, I'm going to give you guys, again, I, I don't know if you guys had enough time to screenshot it before, but I'm going to give you guys, um, <clears throat> maybe I'm going to give you guys like 10 seconds to screenshot it uh, really quick so you can just write it all out so that I can go back to explaining how it's working. Um, 
Can you scroll a little to the right? Can't quite see the rest of the top. Oh, it's just, it's just, it's just identity. So, so when you're working with matrices, identity or like quaternions, identity just means like the default version of it. It's a, it's a references. It's very specific. Um, Wait, would you mind yeah. just copy pasting those three lines into chat? I could. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. I was thinking about doing that, but I wasn't sure if the if if it would <clears throat> if it uh, work properly because sometimes um, sometimes uh, like the white space will be considered something, and it will like mess with the code. But I think you guys should be familiar with how to kind of get around that in case there's any uh, actual issues. But so that's the that's the code. Um, so going line by line. <clears throat> like I said, I'm instantiating a prefab, and then I need to give it um, a location to spawn it. So what I'm doing is I'm getting a reference to that player script um, that I made, the entity player one, and I'm getting a reference to the camera. Um, with that camera reference, I am then accessing its transform. And again, transform is location, rotation, and scale data. I only care about the location, so I specifically get the location or the position of the camera. So essentially, I'm getting the location, the exact location of the player's camera, and then I'm adding. I'm going a little bit out from there. <clears throat> um, by, by basically, uh, so in addition to um, how do I explain this? So, are you guys familiar with like up vectors, right vectors, like uh, forward vectors, that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. So essentially. Um, every actor has a forward vector, and Unity uh, forward vector is essentially just this Z vector here. So basically, um, and if you notice, it will actually move with the rotation of an object. So if I rotate the player, you can see that this this is the now forward vector for the player because it's um, relative to the object. So what I'm basically doing is here I have a reference to my, the transform of the camera. And the transform of the camera will change, and I'm like looking around. You guys know, understand that part. Um, so the transform will change. I'm basically getting the forward vector of the camera, so the direction the character is looking, and I'm going out just a little bit, just so that I'm spawning the projectile right in front of where I'm looking. But this doesn't give it any velocity or anything like that. It's just spawning it um, in the same. Uh, it's spawning it where I'm looking, and like a little bit out, so it's not like spawning right in my head. Does that make sense? If I did not if I did not use a forward vector, it would use um, just like the world rotation and just be like right in front of me in the z direction, which isn't exactly what I would want. I want it to be in the direction that the camera's looking because otherwise, um, theoretically, if I looked behind myself and then shot a bullet, it would spawn in front of the character and then like clip through the character or try to clip through the character to go the direction it actually is expected to um, yeah. go. Uh, so for quaternion identity, it's just the default rotation, which means like no rotation, no rotational changes, just the default um, rotation. So within this projectile reference, I do get component. And uh, because projectile reference is actually a game object. So when I have a reference to the game object, it's just um, an actual physical reference to this ball, this projectile ball. But I need this specific item projectile script on it because I want to manipulate um, some code on it. So what it, to do that, I um, I call this get component function, and it is templated. Um, that's what these angle brackets mean. Um, when you call, when you call a templated function and you pass in a class, it means that it's going to try to essentially cast. Um, it's going to try to cast the return to this type, so that you have a specific type to reference um, to whatever you're trying to get. So I'm trying to get a component that is specifically of type um, item projectile. This will return null if it can't find it. And it will return the actual instance it found otherwise. So I'm getting the instance of the item projectile script that is attached to this bullet here. And then I am uh, getting this owner, this owner variable that I attached to all of them. Um, and I'm sending it to this, to this game object. Uh, what, basically, what this is doing is saying that the owner of this projectile is uh, whatever game object that um, or is the current game object, which is the player, because the player controller is attacked, is attached to um, the player game object. Uh, and by calling just game objects like this, 
if you're, if, if you're in any mono behavior like C sharp, uh, C sharp script, if you just type in game object, it's going to be a reference to whatever uh, game object. It's going to be a reference to whatever game object the script is attached to. So since my player controller script is attached to my game, my, my player game object, um, it's essentially assigning the owner of this projectile to be the player game object, which is me or you guys technically. Then to actually make the ball move, I uh, access the projectile. I access the script again, except I in my script I have a rigid body reference that I um, manually assigned. Uh, and I'm adding a force to that. Essentially, what that force is going to ask for, again, same exact same thing as our jump, actually. It's going to ask for a direction, and it's going to ask for an, a force mode. So um, I want this ball to be shot in the direction the player is looking. So I go to the player, I get the camera, I get the transform of the camera, and I want that forward vector, because that forward vector will be the direction that the camera is pointing. I then multiply it by 30 um, to give it like a good velocity. You can mess around with this whatever you want. The higher the value, the faster it's going to move. The slower the value, the less it's going to move. Um, and if it's really slow, it might just fall straight down because gravity is just going to overwrite whatever um, force you try to apply to it. And I, I'm using the impulse force mode. So once you uh, copy all, the, all that information over, you are going to have a, um, once you go into the game, if you uh, left click, you should shoot a ball that goes uh, pretty fast, and it should have like physics applied, so it should bounce around, uh, you know, and like that. So I hope um, that's working for all you guys. Uh, yep, is that yep. the case? Okay, perfect. So, um, like I said, um, this I want to quickly show off because I think this is pretty important as well. This is this game object reference, and when you instantiate it. It can be anything. So in this case, I set it to a variable called profile projectile prefab that is declared up here. And it's just a game object reference. It could actually just be any game object. So if I were to go here, if I were to right click in the pane, create a new object, I'm just going to call it, um, it would be a cube. I'm going to call it just the bullet or something. Um, I'm actually going to open, I'm going to, take this object, I'm going to drag it into my game objects folder to turn it into a prefab. I'm going to open the prefab editor, and I'm going to set its uh, location to 0, 0, 0 really quick. OK. Um, so now it's centered in the world. Uh, the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a, a rigid body, I guess. I'm going to give it a rigid body uh, by clicking the Add Component and typing in rigid body. Uh, this is all fine. I'm going to change the collision to continuous dynamic. And then I'm going to um, go add a component. And then that um, item projectile script I already had made for you guys, you can actually just open and make another one. And then you see this owner tag here. We don't need to do anything here, but that rigid body reference, we're actually going to click. Whoops. We're going to click and drag on rigid body up here and then drag it down to that reference. So you guys see that, right? Is able to do that. You can also click the three dots here, and um, you should be able to just directly set it to the. Yeah, so like here I can set it to none, and then here if I click the bullet, I'll just use the rigid value of the bullet. You can also just drag it. Same thing. So if you have that, this is actually, for all intents and purposes, this is another um, game object that we can instantiate by shooting. So if I were then to go onto the player character, and then I go down to that con character controller script, and if I change that projectile reference to actually a reference to that bullet I made, quote unquote, uh, where is it? Here. Now I should actually just be able to shoot cubes. So if I play, if I go into play, I, I just shoot. I just shoot cubes because, like I said, it doesn't actually matter. It doesn't matter what that game object is. It's just. Um, yeah. Uh, however, there is something I will show you is that it will it will literally accept any game object, which means that if I, for example, change it to a game object that does not have this item projectile script, it will actually throw an error. But Unity is pretty nice about its error handling and it won't crash the game. It'll just give you um, a red error message down here saying that something went wrong. So if I go into this bullet prefab that I made and I remove the item script, remove component, and then go back out. 
um, and I hit play, you'll notice it still spawned the thing. It still spawned it in, but um, you notice it has absolutely no um, force applied to it at all. And if you'll also notice, if you look uh, down here, uh, you'll see no reference exception uh, while executing the action. Uh, object reference not set into N6 of object. That's because um, it's looking for that um, item projectile script um, in order to set its velocity, and uh, it's not finding it. And if you ever get an error in Unity, you can actually double click on the error message, and it'll actually take you to the line that caused the issue. And you can see right here, it's using that game object reference, and it's trying to get the item projectile component on it, but it doesn't find one, so it returns null. And then you're trying to set a null for, you're trying to assign something to a null reference, it's not going to work, um, as you guys should understand. So um, that I, all of that was just to show that the game object reference here doesn't actually matter what it is. It's just like, it's like it could, that's just to show how versatile it is. You just need to ensure that any um, component-specific code, um, you, you're just ensuring that whatever you're spawning actually has the component-specific code that it's looking for. So uh, yeah, I'm going to really quickly uh, go back to the game, stop playing, close that. I'm going to set the reference back to the, the normal projectile. Um, and there we go. And now it should go back to just being our default projectile. So now that we have jumping and movement set up, uh, you, you guys will probably see this big uh, button-like thing that I uh, made. Uh, the intent was that um, if it's, I assign some code to it so that if it's ever hit with a projectile, it should do something. But you notice the button doesn't actually work. So the reason for that is, is I removed the code from it so that you guys could see um, how this thing is working. So in order to explain it, I'm going to show uh, the, all the scripts, but most of them will already actually have the code set up. It's just more so explaining how inheritance work. Um, so here is um, the the base class for all of the interactable items in the game. So if you noticed, um, the projectile is also one of these, but it's just um, a child class. So you have public class item parent extends mono behavior. So it is a, it's a, it's a unity mono, uh, mono behavior, and it has a owner reference, but it doesn't actually do anything with that, uh, at least not yet. So if I actually go back to um, here, and I go to the item parent class here, you'll see the only thing that's missing is I made a virtual function called activate effect. So basically, um, if you copy it over, and I guess I'll drop it in uh, chat really quick. Uh, I, I'm going to add it back over here. Um, this is a virtual function. Uh, for those who don't know, when you have um, in, the way in, uh, virtual functions work with inheritance is that when something is declared virtual, that means it can be overridden in a derived class and either have its own unique implementation or add some implementation to the parent class's uh, implementation of that function. So I, this is how uh, is expected to be done in at, at least Unity's version of C Sharp is it needs to be public. It will give you an error if it doesn't, if it's not, or at least it did in my case. It needs to have the virtual keyword, then its return type, which in this case is void, then the function needs its name, and then I guess any parameters you want to pass into it. But for our case, we do not need any um, parameters. All right, so from there, uh, the actual button class should be completely set up if I, oh, I did remove something. So um, here in the button class, essentially, it's notice it is extending item parent. Um, all it adds is one variable called linked object, um, and it has a collision uh, function attached to it. So here you can see uh, void on collision enter is uh, Unity's, uh, one, of, one of Unity's uh, ways of handling collision. Basically, it says that when something collides with it, it will generate a collision class um, instance. In this case, I called it collision event. You can call it whatever you want. But this is basically saying that an object has collided with the um, collider attached to whatever the script is attached to. So something like 
bumped into this object or this object bumped into something. And what I do here is first, as I say, um, if the game object that if the game object that bumped into this uh, bumped into the object this is attached to has an item projectile component or a project item projectile component, um, run this code, which is basically seeing if link object has actually been set to something, and if it has, and the linked object has the um, item parent. Uh, some derivative of item parent attached to it, call do something. And that something in this case is I want to call that activate effect function that I just uh, had you guys write down. So you here. And then I'm going to paste it into not this version, but this version. And now it's going to call that activate effect. So basically what this does is it allows the button, anything attached to the, effectively any button can now um, call that activate effect script um, on an on a uh, item that it's linked to. Uh, I guess it's easier to understand if it's demonstrated, but essentially um, when you set this game object reference to another item, and something bumps into this, and a projectile that gets shot out is um, attached to it. It'll basically call the activate effect um, function on whatever you, uh, whatever game object you set this to. And the way I use this, or one example of the way I use this, is um, making this bridge visible. If you notice, it's not actually visible when you play it in game. Um, and I, I think there's still some code missing if you want to actually make it work. But if I hit this, you see it will. Call you see it and the message log will say activated, which means it actually called it on something, but it didn't actually do anything. Uh, that's because some code's missing. But I just want to show you guys that um, that debug statement does get activated when the balls bump into it, which means that if you look at the parent class here, uh, not here, sorry. If you look at the parent class up here, um, it's this. This is getting printed on something, and that something is um, the bridge that I manually linked the button to. So if I, I want right, to have you guys look at one more script, which is the item appear script. So here, you notice on, on start, it will actually, whatever game object that the script is attached to, it's automatically going to make it disappear. So set active uh, effects, whether an object is being rendered and handling collision. And when you set it to false, it's not going to be visible. It's not going to have collision. It's not going to do anything. And then uh, when it's true, and it's usually true by default, um, it will act as you'd expect. It's visible, it's interactable, and it's running its code. Oh, by the way, I probably should um, take a moment to make sure that I haven't lost anybody, right? Yeah, you're right. OK. Um, so if I go here. Um, I actually override, I now override that um, activate effect function that I wrote in the parent class. So here, as you can see, item appear is a um, child class of, uh, is a child class of item parent. And remember that this item button class is going to any, uh, anything that interacts with it, it will call that function on it if it's bound to it. I should phrase that better, but um, it'll be easier once I uh, actually just write the code and uh, show it to you guys. Uh, basically, um, I get what um, this is doing is basically when it, it receives the activate effect function call, it's going to set the game object to active. So how does this work? Well, if you take a look at this bridge I made, I actually attach this item as peer script to it. And all it's going to do is when its activate effect it gets called, it's going to set its um, self, its own active state to true. And that's and it, well, that will make it appear. So if you actually look on the button here, you know that linked object variable I set or that I had declared um, right here? Um, you, you're going to go in, in the actual Unity editor. You can actually set it to any object that has this item appear script on it. And you can uh, 
just drag it in. So if you see here, it's going to highlight this ramp extra long one. Um, if I actually clear the reference here to none, uh, all you have to do is go to that ramp extra long one and set it right here by dragging it in. And now, basically, when the button gets hit, it's going to uh, buy a projectile. It's going to go to the item it's linked to, which in this case is the bridge. Um, and it's going to call its activate effect function. And since the bridge, the bridge's activate effect function just makes it visible, that's what's going to happen. So if I hit play now, um, and I just like spam, try to hit the button at some point, you see at the moment it gets hit, the bridge will appear, and you're actually able to like uh, walk on it and interact with it, uh, which lets you go into the um, other parts of the map that are not yet done. So um, have, you guys, have you guys been able to complete that? The only, if it wasn't clear, the only step you have to do is just add this to item button and then add this to um, the item appear uh, class. Because I already, I, I already had the objects linked up. It just, I unlinked them just to show you guys what it looks like when you don't have that set up for you. Oh, make sure you're, you're not playing the game, right? So like, if you're in the game, make sure you stop play and you go back to scene view and that game view is not active, um, just to make sure that uh, it can like actually compile. Because it's not going to compile and work while you're playing the game. So make sure that you close the uh, stop play and then uh, make sure that it, ha it compiles that. And then um, it should work, because I believe that's the only things we added to make this work. So um, the next thing you know is you have these cannons, but they don't actually do anything. So uh, you're going to want to go into your assets, scripts, um, item scripts. You'll see it's completely empty. Um, essentially, uh, the only code I believe I added to this was, oh, a lot, apparently. So let's break this up. So first, we're going to want to declare what variables we need. So I'm going to paste these in chat, and then also paste them here. So we're going to start off with these four variables. So OK, we, have a, we, we made the can in prefab, right? So we, have a, we defined a spawn point. Actually, I'd probably show this off by the actual prefab. So if you go to the can in prefab, well, canon, you'll see that it's, it's just made of three things. There's um, an empty transform that's just like showing the whole object. You have the barrel of the cannon that's just a cylinder that's hollow. Inside of that, you have a spawn point um, that's right here. Uh, you can click on it. It's empty. It's just supposed to be the point where the balls spawn. And then we have a base, which is just a cube, uh, just so it's not just like a floating barrel with no actual like, cannon part. Um, so we have um, in that script attached to it, we have we need a reference to like what is this cannon going to shoot? Okay, so we need a game object reference to that. Um, I just called it projectile prefab because we're going to be shooting a projectile at the cannon. Um, then we need a reference to the location where this projectile is going to be spawned at. I call it spawn point. Um, then we're going to want a a float defined for the cooldown of this uh, shooting. We don't want it to shoot continuously, right? Or only shoot once and then never shoot again. That would be both of those would be problematic. And then just for the point of customization, we also have a float. We're saying, how hard is this projectile getting shot? So um, in the start method, which is, again, one of Unity's uh, predefined functions uh, that you can invoke, this gets called before it starts um, doing the update um, loop. And so this code is only run one time, as opposed to the update loops running, update loops running every frame. So on the start, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you an error at first, because we haven't wrote, uh, defined the function yet. We're going to start a coroutine, which is basically kind of like a timer that runs in the background um, in Unity. So uh, as we're calling the shoot using the coroutine. We're going to call the shoot cooldown function um, given using that cooldown float we made to define the length of the shooting cooldown uh, since we're able to actually modify this. Um, so it's going to have a red squiggly line because we haven't actually pasted the function in yet. So uh, if I go back over here and add in the shoot function, it's right here. We have 
uh, under start, I'm just going to paste it in, and I'm going to give it to you guys as well. Um, we have a new function. This one's not a void function. It returns a type of I enumerator, and that is an interface um, that Unity uses for um, timers. Then there's just the name of the function, which is shoot cooldown, and it's going to expect a cooldown. And right here, this is the function. This is the line of code you need when working with I enumerators. It tells you how long is um, how long is the timer essentially. So you type in exactly yield return new wait for seconds, and then how long to wait. In this case, the time we wait is the cooldown length, uh, which we specify up here. And then once that's done, you want to call the shoot projectile, uh, the shoot function um, that has the parameter projectile force, which is how hard it's going to shoot that projectile. Um, I pasted the last code, right? Yeah, OK. Um, and right here, we have our shoot function. Let me give it to you guys as well. So in our shoot function, again, we're passing in the projectile force. We're going to make a game object reference that is a reference to a specific projectile instance that we want to instantiate or to like instantiate and reference. Um, so we're going to do the same thing we did with the with the with the character shooting, except the only difference is the location it's being spawned at. So we're going to that projectile reference we just made. We're going to call the instantiate function to instantiate a prefab that is of type the projectile prefab that we just assigned. As you see when I highlight it here, it's referencing this up here. So whatever projectile prefab you assign to it is a projectile prefab it's going to shoot. Then the spawn point is going to be um, the tr uh, we're going to get the spawn point, and that transform position is going to be the location it's going to be spawned at. So if I actually open up the prefab again. Um, You'll notice on the ball cannon item cannon script, uh, you see the projectile prefab is none, and the spawn point is none. Um, the projectile prefab is just going to be uh, the projectile prefab we have defined for the player. Uh, so if you go into game objects, projectile, well, first of all, uh, click ball cannon like this, and you're going to drag the projectile prefab right here um, so that we're referencing that projectile prefab now. So now that this reference is set, this value, this uh, variable is now referencing that prefab. And now we need to do the same thing for spawn point. So we're going to go to that spawn point thing we made, uh, spawn point empty. We're going to click it and drag it into the spawn point here. So now that spawn point variable we made in the code is referencing that spawn point. And then the cooldown and projectile force can say 0, 0 for now. Um, so now basically what it's doing is responding that prefab at, that, at the spawn point's position. Uh, with no rotation change applied to it, so it's the default rotation. Then we're going to get its item projectile script and set the owner to this cannon. In this, so we're calling that we're using that same game object reference, but this time we're not in the player script. We're in the item cannon script that's attached to the cannon. So the game object is going to be referencing the cannon. So the owner is the cannon essentially. Then here we have our item projectile rigid body reference. We're going to add that force. We're going to add a force to it so that once it spawns, it gets launched as if the cannon is shooting the ball. So from that spawn point transform, we're going to get the forward vector, which again is that blue vector, that blue Z vector line uh, right here. Facing, it's facing outwards. If it was facing a different direction, it wouldn't shoot down the muzzle of the cannon. Um, it's going that forward direction. Uh, this is a unit vector, so it's only going to be of magnitude 1. So we multiply it by the projectile force, which we um, set up here, which we have up here, which we're able to freely set once we spawn an instance of this cannon up, and it's just an impulse. Then we start that coroutine yet again. You see it's the same line of code. Um, we start, we uh, basically wait another uh, period of time of length cooldown before we shoot again. So essentially, the loop goes like this. When the cannon spawns the world, it's not going to shoot right away. It's actually going to engage its cooldown. Once its cooldown finishes, it's going to shoot. So it's going to shoot the bullet, then it's going to start that cooldown again. And then uh, it's going to wait for the cooldown to finish, then shoot, wait, shoot, and it does that forever. That's how it's coded to work. Um, once you save that, uh, and once you also um, make those changes to the prefab, again, you're going to need to make sure you set the owner. Oh, the owner, uh, you don't have to set the ball cannon. Um, it's 
helpful if you do for the damage system, but it's not necessary. Uh, projectile prefab does need to be set to projectile, and the spawn point does need to be set to spawn point. Once you do that, um, you can exit out of the prefab editor, and it, you should these cannons should actually start shooting. So if I now hit the button, uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, you see the cannons are now shooting those balls. And if you notice, if you get hit by them, uh, they will deal damage. Your health bar will go down a little bit uh, because of some code I wrote that I'll explain in a moment. But I want to make sure you guys are here. The cannons are shooting balls, uh, the balls for you guys. But essentially, um, so it's a, little, it's a little hidden, but if you actually click on these cannons, it'll, it'll open up where its actual location, and you should be able to see the um, um, it's its owner, it sets its owner, and it has a projectile class and a spawn point assigned to it. And then here, in these actual instances, I actually set the cooldown and the projectile force. So on each individual cannon, each of these cannons, I set the cooldown to one second, and I set the projectile force to 30. Um, but theoretically, they can all be different. So um, if I actually drag and drop a ball cannon right into the, into the world here, and then I'm going to rotate it so it's facing upwards. Uh, Make it facing straight up. And then here, if you notice, I have the cooldown set to zero and the projectile force set to zero. I don't exactly know what, yeah. Oh, so in Unity, it's just going to run a timer of zero seconds and shoot a million balls. Yeah, you probably don't want to do that because if your hardware isn't beefy enough, it might be a bit of a problem. I'm actually going to shut this down, make sure my laptop doesn't crash. Um, we're going to set this to so anything. It could be like 0.5. And then projectile force. I'm surprised the projectile force of zero goes that hard. Is it just because of so many spawning in? Yeah, so see, let's see with the projectile force of um, zero. Um, the only thing that's pushing them forward is the actual collision responses between the balls. Um, so we can actually change that again. Let's set this to 60, twice as fast as the other cannons, approximately. But yeah, you see we have our completely customizable uh, cannon that can shoot at our desired um, strength and frequency. Were you guys able to uh, resolve your problems with the cannons, or uh, do yeah, you I need got some? It. I got it. Uh, okay. You. All right. Um, yeah. So that's just showing off how it works. I just have some statically placed over there, so you can see it. Um, to essentially explain how the character is um, taking damage, I I'm going to try to show you guys. As you see, when we if you bump into a ball, you spawned, um, like these ones over here. I don't take any damage when I bump into them. But if I bump into these balls, which are spawned by the cannons, you'll notice my character is damaged and the ball is destroyed. So why does that happen? Uh, that happens because of a piece of code I wrote on the uh, player, entity player, uh, dot cs script so in the same script where we set all our values for health and stuff you can actually customize these too if you want to have different maximum health and whatnot um you'll see in the oh yeah this shouldn't be here you'll see in the on collision enter so when we collide with something um we actually i actually set up the jump system to be really basic so that if you collide with anything um, it resets your jump count to zero. And then um, the way we detect the balls is that if the collider, if the game object attached to the collider that caused the collision event with the player has an item projectile um, component, um, run the associated code. If it does not have a item projectile component, it does nothing. So when I bump into the floor, it will do this, it returns false, and then it just basically exits because there's no code after this. Um, so if it is a projectile, however, um, if, it's, if its owner is different from the current game object, so if the owner of the projectile is not the current game object, and remember, the current game object is the player, so essentially if the ball, if the originator of the ball is not the player, um, destroy the ball, deduct 10 points of health um, from my current health, uh, clamp it between zero and um, my maximum health so that the my HP is never lower than zero or higher than the ma my maximum health. 
then um, health normalized is just what I use to um, get a normalized value between 0 and 1 of the current health over the total health so that I can set the health bar percentage. <clears throat> and that's what this health bar reference does. It's just saying set percent um, to, um, it's just, it accepts a value between 0 and 1. So um, I just pass in that normalized value. And then I also just debug some, throw some debug statements I forgot to remove. And then here, if we wanted to, we could write like some kind of death state um, if we wanted to like reset ourselves to the origin point of the world, if we wanted to like run a cutscene or whatever, you can put it in here. Um, I'll add that later if we have time, but I'm just showing you where the damage is actually calculated. Uh, and with that, I think we covered most of the scripts that um, I've set up. I don't think there's any that I missed. Uh, I can go over the health bar really quick. So um, essentially, all the health bar is, is you'll see if you scream out this massive canvas. Um, this canvas just gets applied to the player screen once the game starts. Um, on that canvas, if you look into here, there's an image, and it's just black. Um, and it has a slider attached to it, as well as, um, yeah, it just has um, the slider attached to it. Essentially, um, <clears throat> what happens is, uh, Here's what I was looking for. Uh, the there's an there's a progress bar, and there's a second image that's red above an image that's black, and uh, against the red image, I attach a slider, and when that value changes between zero and one, it actually sets the scale of the red box that's in front of the black box. So that's how the health bar is set up, and um, I'm just manually changing it with code. So that's what this health bar script is. It just you just get a slider reference, and then um, once that's uh, by default, make sure that the slider's full because the character is going to spawn with max health in this game always. And then that set percent function is here, where I just set the value of the slider to the percentage, which is in this case the health, the normalized value um, of the health, right over here. Yeah, right here. And um, you can actually customize the range, so you can set the mix, the min and max value to whatever you want. So theoretically. I could actually forget about the health normalized variable and just make it so that the min value is zero and the max value is like 100 or my maximum health value. But I just did it this way because um, most of the time working between zero and one is just fine enough and it's easy to calculate the normalized value. So it's better in my opinion than just uh, constantly shifting the maximum health value and the current health value to match the bar. All right. So I guess things to quickly show off with the project as well. Um, this is most of what I had preset up, but there are obviously things that can be easily added. So once you like the buttons, since the buttons don't specifically um, make the bridges appear, they can actually be used to activate anything. Um, I, was, I, was, I only use the buttons here to kind of spawn in bridges once they get hit, but um, you're able to do a lot with them. Let me make sure I don't fall. Uh, and also as a side effect, really quick to show you of the movement uh, speed script I made, or not the movement speed, the uh, jumping script. Since it resets the jump counter every time you hit an object, this game as a uh, side effect actually has wall jumping. So if you want to avoid the cannons, you can actually just wall jump back and forward, kind of like Mario. And um, yeah, you can skip the cannon section. So I didn't, I, th this is all that I wrote um, just for this, a workshop because I wasn't sure how far we got and I didn't want to make a bunch of stuff that um, like obfuscated the core of the project and then it turns out that like we don't even get there. So we actually have about 18 minutes. Uh, if you guys want to ask any questions, um, I'm also going to sit here and just keep implementing stuff so you guys can kind of see, um, I guess, my workflow when it comes to working in games. I'm not the, like I said, I'm not the best with Unity because I actually only use Unreal Engine, but uh, yeah, this is, I guess, the unofficial ending of the Unity Workshop. Thank you guys for showing up. I appreciate uh, also your patience because it was a little uh, janky getting started because I, because of that problem I did not anticipate running into. But other than that, I hope you uh, enjoy the tutorial. And uh, if you have any questions, like I said, you're free to ask them now. Uh, and I can also help you guys with any questions you have. All right. So. I'm just going to mess around a bit with this map <laughs> while I don't receive any questions and change this to like 
45. I have a question. I have a question. Uh, did you say that the... Um, uh, the uh the workshop just now would be was recorded and be uploaded yeah so that the whole workshop should be recorded um and and uploaded to our youtube however even if or like i said so you can re go back and reference the video but also don't be afraid to come and ask uh me or or ideally the people who are better at me uh with unity any questions but i'll definitely receive any questions about uh uh, you know, any questions you have for me. But yeah, it should be recorded. All right, and another question. Will uh, future workshops be like, I know this one was the idea. So do you guys plan doing one for like Unreal and et cetera and whatnot? So um, we are doing one for Godot uh, next week, I believe. However, mm -hmm. um, the reason that I'm not doing like an Unreal Engine workshop and I'm still doing like Unity is the kind of approachability. You saw how um, you saw how it took a sec to get started just because people didn't exactly have it downloaded yet. And even if we yeah, Unreal is like, massive too. Yeah, so um, I could kind of show you some reasons why um, we don't teach Unreal Engine uh, after this, but I'm going to open it up still to Unity related questions. Basically, the short version is um, as someone who works with Unreal, Unreal Engine, I understand that it's actually much more technically involved than Unity. And even though I'm, it's much easier for me to teach lessons in Unreal Engine because I'm familiar with it, um, I would have to cover so much that we would essentially wouldn't get anywhere with any workshop. Like this workshop would need to be twice as long. And even then, there's some people who probably would struggle to download it. Like the engine is huge, and there's a lot of obfuscated details that a lot of people um, aren't originally aware of, and some people who work with the engine are still un unaware of them because, like I said, it's like a rabbit hole. But um, mm -hmm. Unity's uh, pretty small, so like setting up this package wasn't hard because it was like very easy for you to download. Whereas if I try to package the Unreal Engine game, it would be like pretty gigantic. Um, yeah. Again, I will. I can go in further detail with you after the workshop if you uh, care to listen. But I just want to open it up to any Unity specific questions while I'm in this engine. I was just I was just asking in general. I wasn't trying to like, oh yeah, I'll do an entire Unreal presentation. Like, no, I was just curious on what the plans were for the workshops in general. Yeah. No. Like I said, I I have no qualms with showing you some of the stuff I've worked on, so you can kind of like see what I mean. Whereas like it's much more. Um, it's just it's just not as approachable as Unity. Like if Unity, uh, like I, I guess the easiest way to describe it is, I would it'd be much better for people to get like a solid grasp on Unity than to get like a beginner's understanding of Unreal Engine and not really be able to do much of anything with it. Because the the reason we do these workshops to begin with is that for those who want to join a game pitch but don't feel confident in like getting started, I suppose it Unity and Godot are beginner engines enough that um they can at least approach. Um, helping out with coding and stuff if they want to. Um, yeah, well, I, I know. Hmm? I do have two concerns. I guess the more important one is uh, I don't think the health bar ever appeared when I played when I played out the scenes. Oh, the health bar did not appear for you. Yeah. Uh, maybe it might have went some point. I have like a vague memory of it, but it really hasn't okay. been for the past few. Yeah, did you start out with the health bar, or did you put that in at some point? Because I don't have one start. You also don't have a health bar. Okay, that must mean that I did not. I forgot to somehow package it. So when you go into when you zoom out in your scene, do you see this big canvas panel, or like if you go into your hierarchy, do you see this um, canvas right here, and then? It, under an image and a progress bar. Do you guys have this in your scenes? Because actually, um, I, I should have packaged it, but I, maybe I missed it. Uh, it looks like it, yeah. A big old okay. white box there, but there's just, I don't see a health bar in it. Let me double check. Huh. So you guys don't see this red uh, box yeah, here? I also have a, yeah, I have a white box with no health bar as well. Did, did, but is the red box here? The health, the actual health bar? Do you, do you see these two? Uh, I don't have a red box. I don't know if Nevis does. Okay, so I guess somehow I didn't package with the rest of the stuff. I'm going to try to recreate it really quickly, and I'm just going to delete mine in here. 
Okay, I'm gonna delete this. And I'm just gonna walk you guys. Appears to be stuck. Camera stuck. Uh, do you see like the hand image like on the screen in the top left, Nevis? Yeah. Uh, do you have that selected? I do. Oh, dang! I don't know. That. Yeah, I, mean, I was able to move around when I would hold the right click, and then uh, you know, wasp my way around. But uh. When I when I stretched yeah. out far enough to look at the white box, it just uh, it just stopped moving. Hmm. Are you are you try so hit like hold right click and hit the W key and then scroll forward with your mouse. Does, does it are you like are you are you able to change your movement speed? Because you, you might have set your movement speed to like zero. So if you see here, I set it to like zero point one, so it looks like I'm not moving. Or is you having a different problem entirely? And are you, excuse me, are are you having a different problem entirely? Uh, that seemed to help, but now it's moving. It starts out kind of slow and then ramps up to full speed. Yeah, that's kind of how it works. You see, for me as well, um, I'll move really slowly, and then as I as it goes forward, I'll just like ramp up to like two times speed. It's just how they implemented moving in the editor. I don't really, I'm sure someone who's more familiar with Unity can explain how to do, how to fix that. But see, also, if you notice, the actual game, gameplay world is really small, so if you go far out, you just can't see it. Whereas as I zoom towards it, you'll see it uh, grow in size. And Yeah. yeah no, it's fair. I think I might have used, I might have accidentally scrolled it down for a bit. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So yeah, really quick. Yeah, so confirm. Don't have the health bar, but do have the the canvas. Okay. So on the canvas panel, can you right click like um here, go to UI, go to image, and just leave the name as image. Uh, you should see a if you like zoom out to your to your health bar, you should see a big um a big white square appear in the mm -hmm. center. Okay, let me try to just go up to mine because and zoom out a bit too. Okay, so we're gonna under so with that image selected in the hierarchy pane, and you hit add component, and you're going to type in slider, and then click the slider component. Um, once you have that, go to transition here. Click from color tint, set it to none. So the transition should be none. Then with navigation, it should be set to automatic, but change that to none. So transition should be none, navigation should be none. Do you have that? Might have lost the add component button there. Okay, so scroll scroll down. Um, so you see oh, yeah, if you yeah, scroll yeah. down, hit add component, and then type in SLI, and slider should appear. There it is. Okay, nice. Um, then transition, click the drop down menu, select none. And then for navigation, select the drop down menu and select none. All right. All right, nice. Okay, so um, what I'm going to have you do really quickly, uh, you might want to change the height to like 50 or something. So that's like approximately by shaped. You can mess around with the values. I'm going to set it to like. 10. No, I'm going to set it to like 25. Just make it like approximately bar shaped. It doesn't have to be final. It's just something so you can have a little feel for it. Uh, on the image, uh, go back to your hierarchy pane. On image, uh, right click, UI, image. And then this one we're going to call progress bar, or at least that's what I'm going to call it. I'm sorry, what'd you do there? You went to image. Maybe so, maybe? so on on the on the image that we already created, right click UI, create another image, call it something that's not image, like progress bar or whatever you want. Oh, well, there it is. It just happened. Okay. Oh, that's what? interesting. Actually, that our the, was it. Progress bar was already in my image, but it was called image until I made a new image called image. Which then renamed itself to Progress Bar. Okay, so something got weird with Unity. So it, you're, it looks, sounds like the health bar was there, but it was like funky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same with yeah. I see. So if you change the actual color of the of the actual image, 
so if you change the image color to um, black, and then you can change the progress bar color to red, you'll get that black on red thing I told you about. Uh, let me kind of zoom in here. Um, you won't be able to see the black bar because your progress bar will be um, covering it. Uh, before, before we go on, though, um, select the image um, and the hierarchy pane. And then you should, so you see how it says fill rect under slider? It says none rect transform. Uh, right click, uh, so you see where it says fill rect here? Um, click the circle and click progress bar. And you should see that the progress bar now snaps to a location. Uh, are you guys at this step right here? Uh, is there a giant red X below your stage? Is that a thing? Uh, I don't see anything. Okay, like that. that's what I have. That's what the image was. Okay, that's interesting. But do you have a red square with a black square slash rectangle? I'll have to get that up. I'll, I'll cook that up real quick. Okay. Yeah, all we did was make a second image that's a child of that original image, and I called mine progress bar. Then I clicked the image. I scrolled down to the slider. Under the fill rect section, I clicked the circle, and I selected the progress bar that we just made. That... Um, I colored them different colors just so they're easily visible. If you leave them as both white, it might be hard to see. I changed the background to black and the front of the health bar to red because health bars are usually red. All right, so I got my, my red square and black rectangle. Uh, OK. Right. So for the so click on progress bar. Um, I'm going to have to play around with this a little bit. So set the top to 0, set bottom to 0 and set width to zero. So basically, all of these five values up here, position x, top, position z, width, and bottom, need to be zero. And it should, uh -huh. it should, it, it should look like it completely disappears. That's what it should look like. Yep. OK, so now once you've done that, go back to your image and drag that slider around. You should see it fill up the bar. The red, when you drag the, the value of the slider up and down, you should see the red rectangle scale um, to be up eventually the, the size of the black bar. Do you guys see that? Uh, let's see. I don't think I have that. Uh slider there or that tool, the tool you're using okay no so so when you go to slider make sure you scroll all the way down it should be the last thing in the slider component section this should just, it should just say value and you should be able to like change the value okay. you see here i have a, a this is the error message here specify a rect transform for the slider fill or the slider handle or both parent rect oh okay did you, did you did you set fill rect to your progress bar I did not. All right, I got to do that. OK, yeah. So make sure you set fill rect to the progress bar that you made. So yeah, that's why it would um, work. Yep, there we go. I did, I did OK, it. and now you should be able to slide this up and down. OK, while you're on here, um, right click um, Add Component, click Add Component, and then just type in Health. And then that Health Bar script that we wrote should be down here. OK, so now um, on that slider reference, click your image. Uh, click the slider reference on the image. So you, you can do it two ways. You can hit the circle here and hit image, or you can go to slider and like drag and drop it here. Either way, it will get a reference to the image. OK, once you do that, if you actually hit play, you'll notice that the health bar will just be centered on wherever, wherever it is with respect to the canvas. So, But if you notice, it will. Um, I missed something. What did I miss? Oh, yeah, that's what I missed. OK. Uh, so once you hit play, you'll notice that the health bar is wherever you placed it in the canvas. You guys see that? So for me, it's in the center of the screen. So we got to put it in the corner. Yeah, so you can put it wherever you want. I'm just going to drag mine to the lower left-hand corner. So select image in the hierarchy, and then use the red arrow and the green arrow to position it down. And then if you want to scale it, 
what you want to do is you're going to go to the rect tool here and you're going to just drag the corner and move it to kind of be whatever shape you want you see or whatever rectangle dimension you want mm. so, I'm gonna, so yeah and then once you once you're done with the rect tool i would go back to using the move tool or the hand the view tool either one of those i'd set it to that just so that you're back at um the normal way of interacting with Unity. As you can see, the bar is now on the bottom left of my screen. Um, however, you notice if I actually run into a ball that's not mine, um, I'll get a red error message. That's because we now need to set the health bar reference in onto our uh, character. So if you fly up over to your character, um, it will be called torso in the scene uh, hierarchy pane, but you could also just click on it. Um, you're going to scroll down to entity player and that health bar reference, you're going to um, click the circle and select image. And then uh, if you dropped, if you find some uh, balls that you did not spawn in, then some balls that were spawned in by like a cannon or something, and I, I placed one right here, once you bump into it, it should get destroyed and your health should decrease by 10. Okay. So like you see, I can bump into these balls, so I'll duck my health. Obviously, once it hits zero, nothing happens because we never specified what should happen once the player dies. Um, yeah. One more thing I would like to quickly mention is... Uh, wait a second. I just realized something. There's actually a, a nice little bug in the code. OK, that's actually not hard to fix. So. Um, are you guys, do you guys get the health bar working? Yep. Okay. Uh, let's, I'm going to take a quick look at entity player because for some reason my health is not actually getting clamped. It's not that important. It's just a little interesting thing. If you notice the debug. Either the debug is wrong, or no, it can't be wrong. OK, so for some reason, if you notice, like if you um, take more than 100 damage, it'll actually say that you have negative, your, your current, the value of current health is negative. So I'm going to really quickly go over to the cannon -y section. And there you go. That was weird. OK. And deliberately get shot. So the progress bar correctly stops filling, but you'll notice it'll say negative 10, negative 20 in the little um, debug message. So like somehow I'm, I guess my, maybe the clamp function doesn't work the way I expected, so I would just write my own. So I guess I'll do that in front of you guys really quick so you guys can see how this works. Okay. But instead of instead of using this pre-built function, because I, I genuinely do not think it is working as intended, uh, what I'm instead going to do is uh, say if uh, entity statistics dot health current is less than zero point zero f. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with floats, you can actually specify them however you want. It could be 0f, 0.f, or whatever. I just like to do 0.0f. You don't have to copy that exactly. Um, so if the health bar, so if the health is less than 0, it should be equal to 0. The entity statistics current is equal to 0. I'm going to do um, else if the entity statistics dot health max, or sorry, health current is greater than uh, health max, so entity statistics dot health max. 
then I want to set it to health max. So basically it's clamping it, but we're just doing it manually because for some reason the clamp function doesn't seem to provide the result I was expecting. So I cannot type today. There we go. So the health should not go less than zero. And it should not go greater than 100. All right. Makes sense. Oh, not greater than 100, not greater than health max. Because um, do you guys need me to copy and paste this for you? Or let me make sure it actually works before I. Because that, that's essentially what Clamp should be doing just behind, under the, behind the scenes. Um, it just usually you just it's better to go. I like to go with the implementation that they that um, whatever engine you're using provides because you know there's no reason to reinvent the wheel if there's already a solution available to you. But sometimes things don't, don't have the expected results, so you just gotta do it yourself. Yeah. Now, now if you notice the debug.log statement, it keeps reporting 0, 0.0. It's not going below zero. So I, I click it here. You can see it's reporting zero. Goes one or ten for health current and 0 0.1 for health normalized and then reports zero. So now it looks like it's working properly. Okay, so I will post, I will paste this. <clears throat> for you guys, if you care um, to utilize it, um, no, that is, it along. okay. Yeah, just in case. Uh, Yeah, like I said, there's 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 plenty of place for this expand. I wasn't sure how quickly I'd get through it, so like I left the ability um, to expand a lot of these classes. So like item up here, you can put on theoretically anything, um, and what and uh, whatnot. Uh, if you care to if you care to see that happen, I don't mind doing that for you. But it is technically the end of our workshop, so if you want to go do other things, that is perfectly understandable. Like I said, I'm I'm open uh, now. Either it could end here, or I can continue on if you want to just experience more things like live as opposed to like pre-made.